Okay, so funny as we say it must be nearly a year ago, did I know anything about um, ironstone mining or the old iron deposits around Sleeven here in Swanbar in the area? And I said, funny enough, I actually know quite a bit about them because we hobby of mine research and historical um, um, digging of the ground. Um, so I thought I said, yeah, I'll go talk together and I'll do a bit of research. And I said, you know there were coal mines as well? He says, oh, that's very interesting, throw them in. And then I said, well, people are always interested in limestone because of the caves and the various quarries. And he still threw that in as well, you know? So off I went. So I'm actually going to do it in complete reverse, because most of it's about the ironstones, but I'll just do a wee bit about the limestone first and then the coal. So. Most of the limestones that we would have in Fermanagh are actually the remains of creatures that lived on the sea floor about 320 million years ago when Ireland was actually located somewhere similar to where the Bahamas are today. So it was a lot, um, a lot nicer back then in the area, probably less left. But um, this is just an example of um, um, corals and other creatures in the Bahamas. This is a uh, white limestone beach in the Bahamas um, actually forming today. Uh, I was actually lucky to go to the Bahamas on a field trip to, to get to look at this stuff. And this would have been what the Fermanagh looked like back then. And you can see limestone rocks in Fermanagh that would be very similar to that beach. This is examples of it, Legacara from East Kulka. And within these limestones as well, you can see these little things, and these are actually the remains of fossil corals. Um, on a type called Rubo's corals that have been extinct for, well, I think they've been extinct for about 250 million years. But, um, you know, there's all the evidence in Fermanagh on the mountain through the limestones that this used to be a tropical area with, with, um, with corals, which are um, obviously not what we have today. <laughs> After the limestones, we had a big river came in from Donegal and completely covered the limestones. The big, beautiful tropical sea then became a big sea of mud. And you had big river deltas coming down. So if you sort of think about the landscape now, this would be the mountains in Donegal as they were at the time. Uh, this would be Glen Carr, Glen Eyre, and this would be the, the river delta coming down. And on those river deltas, you got network systems with lots of trees and vegetation growing and when that vegetation died and got buried it turned into fossil plants and we can see these preserved this is an example from a rigna you can see the remains of fossil tree trunks in here and you'll notice that there's a lot of black material which is the carbon from the plants and this is one of the quarries at a rigna at hill street and you can see there's the same coal Running through the sandstones um, in a ring, and that, that's not the coal that they would have mined for the show mine is now. That's a very thin coal, it's only about a third to half of a metre. Um, but it is, it is one of the few places that you can, you can see them well. So that's essentially the limestone and the coal and where they came from. And there's an example of a ring of coal. But what we're mainly going to be interested in here is the iron industry. So what we're going to talk about is how did the iron form in the first place, why we have quite a lot of it in the area. We're going to look at who used it, so who mined it, who used it and what they used it for. It's a history that goes back thousands of years, not just hundreds. And um, sort of discuss how the industry basically died and, and why people have completely forgot or largely completely forgotten about it. So this is up in Kulka. You can see you've got the dark shales and you can see these little bands running through the shale and we'll come back to that but those are little bands of ironstone. So within the shale you've got bands of nodules or discrete thin beds of maybe 25 to 50 centimetres of actual ironstone and it was that ironstone that formed the core of the mining in the sleeve and air in North Calvin, Southwest Fermanagh area. The Geological Survey were very good at recording these. So this is a geological map 
of the Ross Common area down around the Regna. You can see that the geologists at the time recorded everything in extreme detail and all these little bits are where there's rocks sticking out of the ground, mostly in the beds of rivers. So the geologists would have been walking up the rivers with their hammers and hitting the rock and looking at it and, and making notes. And if I just zoom in closer and closer, you'll see it just says here, black and brown shales, iron stones, iron stone nodules abound here. So there's a lot of iron stone in the Arigna area. And this, this river valley between Leitrim and um, Ross Common would have been one of the main iron stone mining areas um, in the 16 and 17 hundreds. Uh, there's absolutely no evidence of any of the ironstone mines anymore, and even where I find them in historical records being recorded, when you go to them, there's, there's absolutely nothing there. Or it may but just be that I'm very reluctant to beat my way through too many brambles. So if we go back to the, um, where we get our ironstones from, there's, there's a variety of different sources. This is the same photograph with the ironstone nodules. What do these look like? You can see it's about a three inch to four inch disc of iron stone. So this will be mostly composed of iron and iron oxide. You can find some quite nice ones. This one's from Arigna as well. Um, it's much larger than I do. And you can actually see it's got a coating of iron sulfide on it as well, which is, which is pyrite. They can also be very small. So these are very small examples from shales in Dungannon beside the old brickworks because the, the shale there had quite a bit of ironstone in it as well. The other source, um, the Swan and Bar Ironworks, if you read the records, was not based on ironstone mining. It was actually based on stripping ironstones off the base of the bog. So if you cut all the turf back, you know, if, you're, if anybody's been on a cutaway bog, you see a layer of orangey red, orangey brown, scummy material at the bottom of the bog, and that's actually iron um, oxide that's accumulated at the base of the bog. And that actually formed um, quite an important um, source of iron in parts of Ireland where there were lots of bog being cut, but very, very little iron stone. So people tried to make an industry out of it. You'll have seen little seeps like this that look like oil on the bog, but in actual fact that's iron oxide and manganese oxide coming out from the base of the bog through the bog. And this is an example of cutaway bog, and you'll see here that the bog's been cut away, but you'll see this pan of orangey brown material, and that, that's pure iron oxide. Um, and if we just zoom in on samples of it, you'll see that's one centimetre. So that's probably two inches across, so that's one example. And you can also find some quite impressive um, specimens of, of iron oxide. So this is the type of material that the Swan and Bar Ironworks was supposed to have worked, whereas the other ones were supposed to have worked the um, ironstone nodules. So here were the first ironstone users. In actual fact, it goes way back. Um, Gordon Toll from the centre used to collect um, fragments of rock from the Cran Oaks in Loch McNeil. So these are the bits that the guys would have knocked off when they were making their tools. So Davy Burns, um, knowing I'm a geologist and being a pest, said, I've got a whole load of these, can you tell me what the rock types are? So I said, yeah, I'll have a look at them. Um, this is what they look like. So here we have a typical Fermanagh chart. This one was easy. This is a County Antrim Flint, or County uh, Tyrone Flint, from around the white limestones up there. But those were easy ones, because the charts are from the limestones in Fermanagh, and the flints are from the limestones in, in the northeast. But these ones really confused me, because they're really fine grained. So it's really difficult, you know, a geologist's nightmare is a dark, fine green rock because you just can't work out what they are by looking at them. So, <coughs> I took one of them, which I think was this one, and this is it actually cut and stuck on a microscope slide and polished until it's incredibly thin so it becomes transparent, so you can put it underneath a microscope and look at it to see what the minerals are. 
and it's still too fine. So we still can't work out what this stuff is. But I assumed it was a siltstone. I said to Davy, it's very fine, it's very hard, it's probably just a siltstone. But it wouldn't go away in the back of my head. So finally persuaded again Trinity College in Dublin to do a technique called X-ray diffraction, which is really brilliant because what it does is it tells you what the minerals actually are in a rock, and you don't have to see them. And hey Presto, this is when we discovered that all this material was uh, siderite, 83%, iron carbonate, iron hydroxide, and a wee bit of iron in your chloride. So effectively, the Neolithic guys in this part of Fermanagh were going up onto the mountain. They were collecting the ironstone nodules because they're hard and strong and flake and work well. And they were cheap and they were local. And they performed for two making an awful lot better than the local church. But the best thing of all for them obviously would have been the flint. But the flint had to come from very far away. So when we looked at all the material found in Rock Brittany, only 5% of it was flint. And most of it was these ironstone nodules. So that's basically Neolithic man making Iron Age tools in this area thousands of years ago were the first people to use the ironstones. Probably nothing happened after that once people actually learned how to make iron tools instead of stone tools. Um, the first early attempts that successfully produced iron, and this is basically when you move into the Iron Age, Medieval Age, are what are called bloomeries, which I think is a great word because it's nothing to do with flowers, but they're called bloomeries. And the reason they're called bloomeries is that the iron ore that comes off the bottom is called a bloom. And a lot of the time these things would have been, the early ones would have been just built, they would have been fired, the iron would have been collected, and then it would have to be rebuilt because you'd have to dismantle them each time. And just to see what one looks like, it's basically charcoal and iron ore or ironstone. It's got a hole to blow iron into and you light it. And you just basically allow it to burn out. And, and all the early ones used charcoal, and charcoal was produced from trees, and we'll come back to that later. This is an archaeologist's drawing of um, a bloomery um, in action. It's probably based on a piece of pottery this size. Um, there's any archaeologists in here, I'm sorry. And this is a, a drawing from a very famous book on uh, metal mining and processing by uh, a guy called Agricola, who wasn't Roman. Um, but I, I like to think of this as um, this guy's at the pizza oven, this guy's drinking the beer, and this guy's making a pie, rather than uh, the process of producing uh, or purifying mm -hmm. iron. So, do we have any bloomeries in this part of the world? Well, actually, funny enough, we do. Um, you're all be aware of the Manic Quarry at Swanland Bar, so before um, any ground was cut there, a full archaeological excavation was done across the entire area. And as part of that, um, Paul Rondelez, who's, well, who was a GCC at the time, and did that archaeological survey, he actually discovered the remnants of a bloomery. And this is actually the clay pipe that you use to blow the air into the bottom of the bloomery. And this is a piece of a remnant of the waste material from the bloom. So when the guys were doing this, they would stack the whole thing up, light it, dismantle it, they would take all the bloom out of the bottom, and it would have pure iron, and it would have what's known as slag. And then they would have to beat it with a hammer to separate the slag from the iron. And that's the reason it's called wrought iron, because you have to hammer it to get the iron out. So this is a bit of uh, chemistry, but basically you put in iron ore, you put in charcoal, you burn it, you get liquid um, metal out in the bloom, and you produce carbon dioxide from doing it. And I have, I have a friend who lives in North Clare, and he's had this archaeological feature in his garden for years from when he bought this wee tumble down house. And he says, what is this? And somebody said, it's a fault for you. And somebody says, no, it's a suterian. And somebody says, no, it's a small round house, hot structure, stuff like that. And he was 
He had some garden beside him all day and he started pulling this stuff out and I said to him, uh, Carl, I solved the problem of what your archaeological feature is. It's, a, it's an iron ore smelter from the medieval period. Um, because I recognised this, this, this slag immediately. Um, and when we analyse that slag, you can see that it contains a huge amount of iron in it. But all the aluminium and silica impurities have gone into the slag. And what's obviously not been left behind um, is the iron, because it would have been used to produce tools. Um, and if it any of the iron had been left behind, it would have rusted. But this impure material doesn't rust, so it gets preserved. I'll skip past Swan and Bar because I'm not there anymore. <laughs> um, so where did the iron ore industry in this area come from? Well, after the flight of the earls and the land grants to um, a lot of guys from across the water, a lot of these guys would have known about iron mining and iron processing um, from the Welsh and English and Scottish um, iron producing areas and one of the big guys in this part of the world in the 1600s was a guy called Sir Charles Coote, who Coote Hill will be named after. Um, very, he became a very, very, very wealthy man. Um, he probably started the industry. He really didn't like the Irish locals. Uh, some of his comments about him would not be allowed on the BBC today. Um, and in 1641, a lot of the foundries in the areas were, were ruined, um, they, were, they were deliberately demolished and um, after Cromwell came over or while the war was still going on, um, Sir Charles Cook unfortunately uh, uh, died in battle. So the, um, the estates and the ownership of everything moved to his son Sir Charles Cook and um, he probably restarted the industry. Um, because certainly there's a record of him being the landowner and a lot of new ironworks starting to appear in the, in the 1650s. Really, it really took off in the late 1600s because um, after the Williamite Wars, there were grants of land to Williamite officers and a lot of them would have been experienced um, in iron mining. And it, it actually extended beyond Britain because there were a lot of those officers would have been um, Dutch or Danish and some of them said most of the workers were sourced from outside Ireland and it's been stated that this is because they didn't trust the Irish but in actual fact it's probably because the people from outside Ireland had more experience and were more knowledgeable workers um, and then as you know they learned you know as the, as the local people learned to trade they would have moved up because they were probably cheaper to employ um, and, you know, people saw about the conditions being horrendous, but they were probably no worse than tin or copper mine in Cornwall or, or coal at the time. So, then we start seeing records that the ironworks are starting to close in the late 1700s. So, um, Drumchandlow closed in 1765, Baldwin Moore's recorded 1747, Swan and Bar 1785. The original mine at Creve Lee near Drum Cairn um, closed in 1768. And you know, why did they all close at roughly the same time? It's very simple. They'd run out of charcoal because they'd cut down all the trees. So the whole area would have been forested before the iron ore industry started. So there were two benefits. You cut the forestry down, you get charcoal that, that runs the iron ore industry, you produce the iron tools, and you're left with productive agricultural land. So it's not too dissimilar from the deforestation of the Amazon today. Uh, the only difference here is that it took, it took around um, 150 to 200 years to do it. The other interesting thing in the research was that you see a lot of references to the Haveny Bridge in Dublin being built with Swan and Bar, Swan and Bar Iron. So I decided to look into this, but the Haveny Bridge was built in 1816 and all the iron foundries in this area were very firmly closed at the time. And there was a guy I met, there was one of the people who attended the Swan and Bar talk and he was determined to find out the truth, so he went off and he found out the truth and he says, yeah. The Haveny Bridge is made from iron from England, so if anybody tells you that the Haveny Bridge is from Swan and Bar, it's not. So, all the iron works 
are basically gone. The last one, 1785. Then the coal was discovered in Slaven Air in Ben Brack and Ben Croy. So a coal mining industry sprung up in the area. And the guys who had some memory of the old iron working, because you know, if you look at this, it's 68 to 52, so you're talking like over 80 years. So there's, there's not going to be anybody there that remembers the iron working at the time, but there would have been records of it. So some people got quite excited about this because they said, hey, we can open up the ironworks. We don't need charcoal because we've got coal and coal is better than charcoal. So let's have a go at that. So they reopened um, they reopened the ironworks at Creeve And actually, fact, they didn't just reopen it. Uh, they built a completely new one. And we're now moving really far from the boomery. So an 1800s iron smelter is a much bigger structure uh, with a hell of a lot more people working in it and a lot more money required to open it up. So that's just a general um, schematic diagram of it. We actually had one in this area at Creve Lee, which is near Drone Cairn. This is what it would have looked like when it was actually operational. Um, it was mostly funded by Scottish investment. Being stops, they went in and they built everything to like, you know, the perfect degree, they were really high quality construction, really high quality operation and all the rest of it. Problem was that they didn't do the research properly and it was discovered that it was cheaper to bring iron from Swansea to Sligo than it was to move iron from Drunkieran to Sligo. So these guys couldn't compete on price because the time their iron got to Sligo to be exported it was already more expensive than Swansea iron and the reason this industry restarted in 1852 and died almost immediately in 1854 was that they never made a penny. They, rather, they, they spent a fortune building this and they never made a penny and, and they basically lost their shirts on it. And that's the end of the story, really, because since 1854, the only people who've had any interest in, in iron and ironstones in the area are historians and, and, and geologists. But of note, such was the quality of the construction of Creve Lee that the blast furnace is still there. So that was built in 1852, so it's now 170 years old. And if you go in, you'll still find all the old refractory brickwork forming the roof of the blast furnace. The stonework has got virtually nothing growing out of it because it's cut so well and it's put together so tight that there's actually no room for grass to grow between the blocks and the only place that you get anything growing on it is a bit of ivy or where you've got a horizontal surface on it. So like that, that's just amazing you know, to see something that old still left. So you know, if we just go back and look, um, this opening here is that opening there. And everything else around it is completely gone. Even these structures are gone and the river going past is you know, gradually eroded them out and washed them away. There used to be an old railway, there used to be iron workers houses built right, right beside it. And um, yeah, when you get back, the only thing that's left is that. That's it. Thank you.